Hi guys, thank you for making your way back from lunch to hear what I think is an incredibly important story um, and in talk about one of the issues that I think is going to really shape how our future generations live. And as Amy said to you, um, it gives me an enormous pleasure to be here. I am inspired by the people around me that I've met the last few days. I am inspired by the nature of the hills surrounding us by the fresh air that we're breathing, by the clean water that comes out of your taps, and by the just immense beauty of the natural environment in which you guys are all lucky enough to live, and I am lucky enough to experience for a very short period of time. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm gonna to talk to you about something uh, I never thought I would have been able to do. Um, a story that if I had been told 20 years ago, I'd be standing here before you saying, this is what I did, I would have just laughed. Um, I'm not a runner, I know that that sounds crazy, given what I'm about to tell you. Um, I started off my running career when I was 22 years old, after being told by the doctors I would never run again. The irony is that I'd never actually run before that. So, uh, <laughs> most people would take that as an opportunity to say, I'm just going to sit down and watch TV and I don't have to do anything. But instead I took that as a bit of a red rag and it's been kind of the story of my life. When someone says that something is impossible, I say, why? Why can't we make something that's impossible possible? Why can't we achieve things that nature says, that humanity says, that people say are not available to us and not possible? So um, I, I have done just that. And I look sometimes, as I was actually putting this presentation together, I was looking at the slides going, I can't actually believe I really did that thing. And it just still seems to me to be something impossible. But nonetheless, I did. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about it today and I'm gonna tell you why I did it. But first, this is what we did. The growing shortage of drinkable water is causing problems around the world. China is drying up. Water is running out. This is out. Sao Paulo's main water the reservoir. reservoir. In the region are drying it's a crisis up. few would expect a water in 21st crisis century that is America. From bad to worse. Most people don't know that we're going to run out of water, usable water. And the World Economic Forum has rated water the number one risk to global society. But to bring awareness to this for the rest of the world, you're going to run the equivalent of 40 marathons, seven deserts, seven continents in just seven weeks to raise awareness. The water crisis, as despite being once told she'd never run again after breaking her back, she'll run across seven deserts on seven continents in just seven weeks. So, starting on the 1st of February of this year, I ran. And I ran across the Tabernas Desert in Spain. And I ran across the Arabian Desert in Jordan. I ran across the Antarctic Desert in Antarctica. I ran across the Simpson Desert in Australia. I ran across the <laughs> deserts in South Africa, in South America and in North America. I did it all in seven weeks. 40 marathons, 1,688 kilometers in your guys' language, over 1,000 miles. And I ran the whole way. <laughs> So again, you know, I look at the, even when I look at this map today, I'm like, wow, that's kind of like a long way. I actually ran a long way, and uh, it's a pretty amazing feat, and I'm really excited by it. But you know what? People ask me why I did this. Um, is it because I love running long distances? I'm like, no, we already ascertained that I never ran before, so. No is the answer to that question. Um, I've become, I've gotten used to running it. I like running through nature. I like meeting people. I like seeing the things around, but that's not why I do this. Is it because I want to raise awareness about water? Yes, definitely because I want to raise awareness about water. But the most important reason why I ran is because I'm trying to build momentum. I'm trying to say, you know, I'm just one person. I'm determined to make a difference on this planet. I'm determined to do something to create awareness around an issue that I believe is so important and so critical to our future generations, and that's water. And I know that I can't do this on my own. I know that I need other people around me. I know that I need to create momentum, and I know I need to do that to raise awareness. So what I really wanted to do when I started running, um, and this is in the Richtersfeld in South Africa, is to really harness the energy, harness the energy that connects all of us and bring it to bear on what I think is one of the biggest threats facing our society. 
because my philosophy was that if I could pull everybody together, if I could create a uniform movement, then we really would have the power to create change in the world. Because as we all know, and one of the reasons we're all sitting here today is because individually we find it hard for our voices to be heard, but collectively we can make an enormous impact on the planet. So I'm going to connect you with some of the stories and some of the people I've seen because you know what? Reading things in a textbook or off the internet never really brings things to life in the same way that you can get life brought to you through stories of the people that you meet around the world. So this is um, the first desert that I went to, which is the Arabian Desert in Jordan. And these people that I met, the experiences that I had in Jordan were quite phenomenal. Um, I think that sometimes it's good to hear from the people directly um, their stories. So I'm going to show you a couple of really short videos through this presentation and you'll hear from people I met with on the ground. Just first of all the enormity of the water crisis that's facing us and second some of the inspiring stories of the things that they're doing to make a difference on this planet. <laughs> فالإنسان لما يكون عنده مي بيحس إنه في مخطر في خطر في إشي ربما يعني يؤدي إلى الموت. جيبوا أم فوقه دي شيء جيبوا جيبوا عنيو بعدين تانيو. أو أنت إلى ما بروبوتيبا كي هو. ستان جندو الأغوا ستان بيرندو تودو. وي لوجو كي سيسكا مُشا كتيرة بيا. سي سابين كي عين بروبلما هي كي Y que bueno, que la única solución es concienciarse en que el agua es para lo que es y, y bueno, y no hay otra. La base fundamental es concienciar un poco a la gente porque tenemos que dejar esos hábitos, si no, lo vamos a pasar mal. I, I know in some streets in, in Amman, they get water like once a month. Because Amman is going too fast, especially the last five years, because of the refugees. Refugees from Iraq, refugees from Palestine, from Syria. أكيد مدام كنا بسوريا المي متوفرة كثير ما تنقطع شحنا نهائيا يعني طبعا عندنا خزانات نخزن مي بس يفضل حالها بتشتغل المي أما لما اجينا على المخيم صرنا نفكر بتوفير المي هذا شيء كثير, كثير كويس لأن نحن نصير نوفر بالمي لأنه معروف عن بلد الأردن هو بلد شحيح بالمياه نحن لازم نوفر مشاننا ومشان غيرنا صح تجينا مي كمية قليلة بس نحن بنوفر فيها شلون يعني مثلا نشطف بالمي It was with great trepidation that I started this journey. Um, I think if anybody had told me really what I was about to do, I would never have started, never have put my running shoes on that first day. Um, and it actually wasn't until day three in this desert, which was the first one, um, the Tabernas Desert in Spain, that I actually really realized the enormity of what I'd set out to do. And we'd run about halfway on that day, so it was about the 22, 23 kilometer mark. And one of the guys came up to me and he said, oh, you know, you've just broken 100 kilometers. And he said, and by the way, you've still got, you know, another 1,588 to go. <laughs> I mean, awesome. Um, and at that point, I realized that um, every day I was going to try and run the equivalent of the gap that is forecast to exist between the demand and supply for water by 2030. So by 2030, experts predict there's going to be a 40% greater demand for water than the supply of water available. And I had embarked on this journey to run 40 marathons to symbolise that number. And I had embarked on this journey to run at least 40 kilometres every single day to symbolise again that number. And on that day three, when I was at the 100 kilometre mark, 1,588 kilometres still left to run, I thought to myself, wow, 40 is like a really big number. <laughs> It was dirty, it was sandy, it was dusty, it was hilly, it was all the things that ultra distance runners uh, tell you you don't want to run in. And put on top of all of that, because of all the stress leading up to this, I was sick as a dog. So I was coughing and I was spluttering and everybody was worried about my lungs and I was worried about my lungs. And all I was doing was sitting there going, what on earth am I doing in this desert in the middle of nowhere? And then, on day three, at the end, towards the end of the day when I was struggling, we ran through this town called Rioja in Spain. And Rioja is a very small village. And as we were running through, we ran through, um, through this valley, basically, which has got an old riverbed at the bottom. Of course, not much water in the riverbed. And 
a farmer came out and he gave me an orange. And that orange was bright and orange and juicy and it was one of the sweetest, tastiest oranges I had ever seen. And the guy who was showing us around um, Spain and who was our guide, our local guide to the area, came up to me and said, you know, Mina, there's a story behind these oranges. These oranges are sold by weight. So the farmers are heavily incentivized to make these oranges weigh as much as they possibly can. So what they do is they overwater their crops and they try to pump these oranges so full of water that they weigh heavier. And I sat there and I said, wow, that's kind of a scary thing. That means that these farmers are heavily incentivized to waste water, to push as much water in, even more water than the oranges need. And he said, yes, that's exactly right. And that is one of the reasons why we have such a major water problem in this part of the planet. And he said, and the other sad part is when you go to the supermarket in the Western countries and you buy your oranges from this part of Spain, and you look at them and you think, wow, a huge amount of these have been discarded along the way. And every time you put a piece of one of those oranges in the bin, you think about just how much water went into producing them. And I sat there and I enjoyed every single drop of the orange. And I thought, you know, we are in the West so, so dissociated in many cases, especially in, in China where I live, in these big high rise buildings. We don't really think where our food came from. And actually this is a theme that you'll see came up a couple of times uh, as I ran through these deserts. So from Spain, uh, we gave every desert a colour, right? So we went then to the pink desert, Jordan. Uh, I had never been to Jordan. I chose Jordan because it is one of the most water scarce countries on the planet. Not only is it one of the most water scarce countries on the planet, it's in a region which is highly volatile and highly forecast to be part of the, one of some of the biggest wars that, that people foresee in history. And in history, um, people talk about you know, this, this opportunity for, for third world wars, um, for third world wars to be fought over water. And um, I think that in Jordan was the first time I really understood what that meant. Um, we met on um, a couple of days into the run. We stopped, in Jordan there's this thing, you know, I guess kind of like Australia, right? You should stop and have a cup of tea. A cup of tea solves every problem. So when things started to get tough, Yusuf, um, who you'll see in a minute, came up to me and said, Mina, I think we need a cup of tea. I'm like, Yusuf, it's all good, I'm good. He goes, no, we need a cup of tea. We're all gonna sit down and have a cup of tea. So we'd go and find a Bedouin community like these guys and we'd sit and talk to the Bedouins. And on this day when we were talking to the Bedouins, the Bedouins said, I said, where are you from? You know, in China, first thing you always ask people is, Nietzsche Fan Lama, have you eaten yet? And the second question is, where are you from? Like, where's your hometown? So of course I meet these guys, I'm like, Nietzsche, have you eaten yet? Yes, we've eaten. And where's your hometown? They said, actually, we're from Saudi Arabia. I said, but you're in Jordan. Yes, we live in Jordan now. Well, I said, right, it doesn't really seem make sense. Did you move? No. What had happened was that this part of Saudi Arabia that they had previously lived in was given to Jordan in exchange for rights over a piece of property that had an underground aquifer underneath it. And there was such desperation for access to water that there had been a trade for coastline for underground aquifer supply. And I guess, you know, that was really a sign to me of the reality of living in an extremely water scarce environment. We'd had several days where we hadn't been able to pick up water. Um, the slide you saw with me pulling water out of a well was at the end of that day when we'd used a discarded metal container to draw water out of a well after looking for water all day. And these guys live in that environment all day, every day. And Yusuf, who's the man I just mentioned to you. Yusuf um, is a funny guy, he speaks fluent English, he's a guide in this area. And he is extremely familiar with a lot of the issues around Jordan. And I want to read to you something that Yusuf um, said to me, which had an enormous impact on how I really saw the rest of my journey panning out. Yusuf said, we do not have enough water to properly supply our own population. And now we have over half a million refugees from Syria. We have to provide for them as well. The question is not, will the water run out in Jordan? The question is when? Perhaps it will be in my lifetime. Definitely it will be in my children's lifetime. 
We will have to move from where we live and eventually all Jordanians will become water refugees in other countries. I fear that World War III will not be because of terrorism or oil, but it will be because of water. From the sandy deserts of Jordan to the white desert of Antarctica. Um, I had never been to Antarctica before. I don't know how many of you have ever been. It's kind of a strange question. Never thought again I would be standing up here and going, yeah, when I was in Antarctica. Um, but when I was in Antarctica, uh, so we landed and uh, this is actually a picture of me running at about three in the morning. It's a, it's a weird thing in Antarctica. The sun doesn't really set. So you have these 24 hour days, which was great for me because it meant that we could catch up on some miles and run basically all day and all night. And as you can see, I'm running into, well, in this case, away from the sun that's supposedly setting in the distance, but actually also coming up at the same time. Um, Antarctica was, a, was an interesting um, thing for me because Antarctica is the biggest desert on the planet. Most people will say to me, why did you run Antarctica? There's lots of, lots of snow and lots of ice and lots of water. And it was weird to have gone from a place where I'd just met with Yusuf talking about there's no water, there's no, there's no water for us either now or in the future. And here was I running on literally re gallons and gallons of fresh water underneath my feet. It was cold, it was incredibly windy, and it was a very, very dry environment. Um, there were a lot of challenges, as you can imagine, about uh, running in Antarctica. This is me running, trying to run in a whiteout. Um, which is literally, you guys live in a place where you have snow. I come from Australia, there's like no snow really in Australia, not like your snow. We have kangaroos, we have koalas, but not snow. And so running in snow was an extremely novel uh, situation for me. And for those of you that have done it, I don't know if you have the same situation here, but the light in Antarctica is really weird. So when you're running on the snow, you can't tell the difference in depth. So you're constantly running, not knowing whether you're putting your foot down you know, here or over the edge, and you'd never know what condition the ice is that you're going to land on because in the summer, in the summer months you have a crust on the top and you often have a big gap of space underneath and you can have enormous gaps of space underneath that you can fall into. So every day when we went out running we had to go out with a stick and put the stick down in the places that I was going to run to make sure that I wasn't going to fall into the abyss, literally. That wouldn't have been much fun. Um, Antarctica is a pretty amazing place, despite my water bottles freezing and thin ice and whiteouts and really you know, incredible environment. Um, it was uh, inspiring, it was lonely, um, it was equal parts information gathering as well as it was about just reflecting about life, civilization, and humanity. It's really the only place on the planet that I went to that I could hear the sound of my own heartbeat. It was quiet, it was silent. There was nothing living there except lichen on the rocks. And in spite of all of that, there's a huge amount of research being done. So I was lucky enough to be the guest of the Australian government um, who had supported me to go down there and to learn more about the research that they're doing. They taught me that Climate change and water are inextricably linked. They showed me their models. They showed me how they collect data. They let me hold ice core samples in my hands, which I looked at and thought, I have 60,000 years worth of data right here. And this data is helping us to understand the future of weather patterns. And those future of weather patterns are helping to farmers and others to adapt to the changing weather conditions and the changing climate. And I let off weather balloons like this one so that we could send up data collection mechanisms into the atmosphere and collect, start to collect data about the changing weather patterns again to help us to provide data modelling and more accurate models. And you know, one of the really interesting things to me about Antarctica is that you know, we think about data in terms of isolated communities collecting this, but in Antarctica, all the communities are working together. The Americans, the French, the Germans, the, the, the Chinese and the Australians gathering and collecting data. So all the conversations that you're having here about climate change and the information that you know is coming from a huge amount of work that's been done down in the south part of the world. So I was freezing cold and got on the plane. 
Okay, so, so getting back from Antarctica is a feat in itself, as you can probably imagine. Um, the plane that takes you back, the Australian government plane, has a thing called the dance floor, which um, is a big open area. So you actually get on the plane and you literally sit on the floor and you dress and undress. So they won't let you take off and they won't let you land until you're fully kitted up in your Antarctic gear. So you can imagine me wearing an Antarctic, big Antarctic jacket and a beanie and a hat and pants, several layers of thermals, big boots, and I rock onto the plane like a big penguin, I can barely walk, and get off at the other end and I'm here. Right, from minus 20 degrees to plus 47 degrees Celsius. Right, 47, I think in your language, is like 130, give or take. Minus 20 is like, well, really super cold. Right, so I felt like I'd gone from a walk-in refrigerator to an oven with the fan on. It was so hot and so sandy. I went from white to this is my orange desert, my red desert, and I was home. And I was so excited to get home, to see koala bears, okay, there weren't any in the desert. Kangaroos, yeah, we saw them. Emus, all those really Australian iconic animals. I was like, yeah, awesome. Going from penguins to, to Australia. And I was super excited. But what I was most excited about was to really start to understand more about what Australia had been doing in the space of water regulation and water management. Because Australia is a pretty amazing place. So Australian, Australia has had a massive decrease in its rainfall. Um, Australia is 70% arid land or desert and yet somehow it manages to survive. And it survived because it's created mechanisms to regulate water. It's got some of the most innovative ways of regulating and managing water in the world. And people around the world are looking to Australia now to say, how have you managed your water supplies? This is a desert. Um, even Australia as a country, as a, natural, as a natural environment, has figured out how to manage water. So you can see it's a desert, but there's still trees growing because under the desert, under, the, uh, under the, the surface are huge aquifers that run beneath and the Aboriginals have figured out how to tap into and how to manage sustainably. And some of the women in the Aboriginal communities that we met would say to me, Mina, you guys don't understand, you white people, you don't understand. Water is life. Without it, we die. From the red sand of Australia to South Africa, um, the Richtersfeld Desert, which we chose because it's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. The Richtersfeld Desert is uh, a desert I actually had never heard of uh, until my cameraman, who then became my kind of brother because we'd bonded over such a long period of like ups and downs, um, who's also a South African or a Safar as we called him. Uh, it told me, you know, you need to go to this desert, you need to go to this place called the Richtersfeld. It's in the bottom tip of the Namibian desert. And the Richtersfeld desert runs between South Africa and Namibia, the most biodiverse desert on the planet. In South Africa, um, you can find species of plants and animals that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. Species like this tree, species like a species of aloe that exist on one very, very specific point of land. Amazing. When we were in the Richtersveld, we met a guy called Peter. Peter is 23 years old, and Peter has lived in the Richtersveld desert all his life. He was brought up by his grandmother. His, his grandmother had given and instilled in him this appreciation for the desert. Peter, 23 years old, had discovered over 20 new species of plants and animals. 20. I'm like, wow. When I was 23, I think I was still like, you know, partying and having a good time. You're making a contribution to the planet in a way that none of us can imagine. And he said to me, no, I'm not making a contribution to the planet. The planet is making a contribution to my life. When we wanted to leave the Richter's Felt, we had made a plan. And the plan was that we would cross uh, this river. It's called the Orange River. And as I mentioned to you, the Richtersfeld runs between South Africa and Namibia. So on this side, you can see where we're standing is South Africa, and on the other side is Namibia. And we're trying to get across. And when we went down there, the guys who were looking after this river crossing said to us, no, you've got to go back. Go back, turn around. We said, well, 
we can't really do that, we've got a plane to catch. And they said, well, bad luck, you've got to drive around. It's a 300 kilometre drive around. You've got to just get back in the car and drive around. And what had happened, as it turned out, is that uh, the river had dropped. And one of the guys that was looking after this crossing, who's the one actually in the little kayak down the bottom, said to me, Mina, when I came here six years ago, the river was six metres higher than it is now. And you can actually see where the river has been. The place that we're standing is six metres down from where it was six years ago. And I said to them, why on earth is this the case? And he said, okay, see over there. And I'm like, where over there? And you can just see it over in the far corner by the mountains on the right hand, top right hand side. And he said, see over there, when you run there, you'll go and you'll see, you'll understand why the river has dropped. So sure enough, I paddled a kayak just like that to get across the river. I've never ever entered a country and written on the immigration form, method of transport kayak. <laughs> um, they did have the gall to ask me what well, did it have a number and where was it? Um, and as we ran from there, we ran through acre after acre of grape plantations. Grapes growing in the middle of the desert. Grapes using the water from this river to grow. And the guy from the grape plantation said to me, the irony about growing grapes is that, first of all, of course, it takes a huge amount of water. But the reality of grapes are that they are a luxury, they're not a food. And these grapes go into the backs of trucks and they bump down not very well made African roads and they eventually make their way to tables in our homes offshore out of Africa, which we sometimes decide to eat. Or if you're like me, I used to be, and I would look at grapes and they're a bit soggy and I would think, mm, don't want to know that, don't want to eat that. And I thought to myself, he's right. The way that we're using water around the world is fundamentally wrong. This experience completely revolutionized how I thought about what we were doing and it completely changed my perspective on life, on my commitment to water. When I started out running, I thought, okay, I'm gonna run and on the 22nd of March, World Water Day, I'm gonna go, you know what, Mina, that was a great thing to do and now you can hang up your running shoes and just chill out. Those 5 a.m. morning runs, gone. And I stood there on the bank of that Orange River and I said to myself, this is never going to end until it's over. I am not going to stop doing this until we have enough water for everybody forever. This was a fundamental turning point in what we were doing. So then we went on and continued the journey and arrived in the Atacama Desert. I had been really looking forward to the Atacama because the Atacama is a place with literally no water. These, there are people that live in this desert that have never, ever, ever seen it rain. They have never seen precipitation fall out of the sky. It's unbelievable. An incredibly beautiful place, but I couldn't understand how people could live there. And then, as we started running, I ran. And I ran and I ran, of course, as I was basically doing every day, running all day. And we ran past dozens and dozens of these little white things. And these white things symbolize mining tenements. And there's not just one, there's thousands of these things. Because it turns out the Atacama Desert is the home of a huge amount of mining. It's where a lot of our minerals come from, from our mobile phones, for our computers, for all the technology that we need every day. Our little clicky devices, everything we need comes from this desert. And it has consequences. Mining has consequences. I'm running here through a mine, which is probably quite well known to all of you. It's where the 33 Chilean miners were trapped underground. This is the mine, where those guys survived days underground, surviving on literally hopes that they were going to be rescued. And then here, which is a place right by the ocean where the Atacama Desert reaches the ocean. And it turns out that thousands of people had died here because they had had... So in the Atacama Desert, sometimes they get um, big rainfall in this particular part. 
and on this day they had had a huge rainfall. Normally the, the people in the Atacama get super excited when they know the rain is coming and they, everybody goes home and they have a big dinner to celebrate the rain coming. So on this occasion they had gone home, they'd all got together in their homes to have these amazing dinners and the rains had come and with the rains had come the tailings of mines that had been mining further upstream. And these tailings created a massive landslide of mud. And that night, instead of celebrating the rain coming, thousands of people died in their homes. And this, of course, is one of the remnants of that. This whole area used to be a township, and it's not anymore. And it's like really depressing, and I was sitting there thinking, wow, this is the sad part about our development, the sad part about where stuff comes from, the sad part about water. I'd run past pipes carrying minerals that they don't bother to put on trucks. They just put in these pipes and then flush these pipes with water to get the minerals from point A to point B. I'd seen the after effects, the aftermath of mining, of our demand for technology. And then, and then I met Hugo. Hugo lives on the top of those cliffs that you saw before in Atacama. The cliff that he lives on top of is overlooking the devastation that I'd just shown you of that landslide. And Hugo was amazing. Hugo inspired me in a way that only a couple of other people we had met along that road inspired me. And I don't want to tell you the story about Hugo because I can't do him justice. Hugo has an amazing occupation. Hugo is a fog catcher. Here's his story. Entonces yo me, me retiré del mar y un día leyendo el Río Bayer vi los locos de las nubes que el 82 en el tofo pusieron a trapaniebla en los cerros altos del, a 800 metros de altura allá en el tofo. Entonces eso me causó eh, gran eh, impacto en mi persona porque yo desde chico vi la niebla y no pensaba que tenía tanta agua. Entonces vine y puse en práctica esto acá en Falda Verde. ¿Y qué es lo que pretendemos nosotros? Nosotros pretendemos que con esta producción de agua hacer prestaciones de servicio y ser sustentable. Vamos a poner lechuga, peces, tomate, de todo, con esta agua. Whenever you think one person can't make a difference, Think about Hugo. Right, Hugo took an issue that he cared about. Hugo found a solution and Hugo shows us the power of one person to innovate, to change the world. And it's primarily because of Hugo that we've actually been able in China to scale our innovation competitions because I really believed after meeting Hugo, I was like, wow, one person had a great idea and made such a big difference in his community. I wonder if we could do that in China. And in China, we've now grown our education um, and our innovation competition from 17,000 people to 150,000 kids, um, thanks largely to the inspiration that we had from Hugo. So our final desert is Death Valley, California, uh, Mojave. And I was so happy, I was so happy to get to the Mojave. It was the final desert, it was the final leg. And by the time I got here, I thought, I'm actually going to be able to achieve this. What I hadn't really thought about or, or understood was how exhausted and at the end of my tether I would be. So the Mojave actually ended up being one of the most difficult deserts um, that I had to face. And in the Mojave, um, every place we went to, we weren't there to run. Of course I needed to run because we'd made a commitment to do the miles and the whole thing was symbolic and it was designed to really create this momentum as I explained to you before. But the real purpose was to find stories, to understand what was going on in each of the different deserts. And in the Mojave, I met another character, this little guy. This little guy is a pupfish. 
I never even knew before what a pupfish is. Pupfishes live, used to live in this big, in a big lake that now no longer exists, and now lives in a very small, in this water hole. And this water hole lives in two places on the planet. It's extremely endangered, and it is fed by underground aquifers that are currently being depleted. The thing about the, the pupfish is that we can restore the pupfish. The pupfish is becoming extinct because we have not managed the environment in which the pupfish is living. If we manage our environment, the pupfish will survive. And this for me was a bit of a kind of a moment to stop and think about how we manage our water, how we manage our societies and how we exist. And really for me, a sign that sometimes the small things in life, the things that we think aren't important are actually incredibly life-giving. And one of those things is water. You know, we turn on the tap, we expect that water is there when we, when, we, when we turn it. And in some cases, it's not. So that's what I've done for water scarcity. Um, it was an amazing adventure. Uh, I learned a lot. I met a lot of amazing people. Uh, what was incredible to me is when we finished and I got the data from what I'd done, I thought that I might have a couple of thousand people that might have seen one of the pieces of media. Let me tell you what happened. When I got back from this run and I got the data, I realized that 2.8 billion people had seen our messages outside China. And inside China, 3 billion people had seen the messages that we'd put out. So, <laughs> uh, you have to remember, like, I'm just a kid from Australia. I grew up with nothing. My dad was an immigrant. I just believe in this thing. I decided that I was going to do something I never thought was possible. I was going to run. I don't know why, what possessed me, but I decided I was going to run. And I started running across these deserts and all of a sudden, the messages were being passed around. People were sending things on. People were pushing the videos and the messages out. And for me, that was just like such an incredibly rewarding opportunity to see. But then I realized, like, okay, this is all awesome, but it's still really small. And let me tell you why. So the World Economic Forum rated water as the number one risk to society, as the number one risk to our society, not just now, but for the next 10 years. When I saw this data, I was like, right, how depressing. <laughs> I just ran around the planet and we've still got a major problem. We turn on the taps, water comes out. We turn on our showers, water comes out. We turn on our hose, water comes out. We talked earlier about the overuse of water in your home state in Idaho. We take water for granted. We're apathetic. But let me show you what's happening. So I told you before that in the next 14 years, there's going to be a 40% difference between demand and supply for water. The areas to focus on right now, when I show you this, are the red and the pink ones, right? The purple, the darkest color of purple. Right. Look where you are. Let's go back and look where you are. That's a pretty bad situation. For many of you, hopefully most of you in this room, we're still going to be alive then. Right? This is our lifetime. This is not talking about future generations, kids of kids, super grandkids. No, this is our lifetime and our generation. Experts predict 40% difference between demand and supply for water. Two in three people won't have enough water to drink. Look to the people on either side of you. Two in three of you will be thirsty. It's a bad situation. And then what happens? When we have water, scarcity, fights happen. In Sao Paulo, they didn't have water for four days. This is a picture from Sao Paulo. In India right now, they're suffering from mass water problems. Trains don't take people, they take water. Farmers in the northwest part of India are committing suicide because they don't have enough water for their crops. They're desolate, dismal, and depressed. In fact, when I got back from my run, I got a plea from one of the farmers there that said, Mina, please can you come and run through our area because we need people to understand that we're trying to grow sugar and we can't grow sugar because we have unfortunately overused our underground aquifers and no longer can get enough water for our crops. People are dying, people are committing suicide. We cannot continue to kick this problem down the road. We often think and think that, you know, oh, it's a problem for tomorrow, it's a problem for next week, there are other things that are more important. 
refugees, climate change, these things are important, but water is an urgent problem because without water, we literally die. We cannot stop and say, next week, next year, next, next month, in 2025, we'll figure out the problem to the solution to this. Because every single day, that gap right there on that slide is going to get bigger. By 2030, we will have reached a point of no return. So we have two options. We can sit here and we can say, in our lifetime, we will get to a point where we have not enough water, where the consequences are dire. Or we can say, actually, you know what, let's do something about it. Because the solutions are actually not that, not that challenging. A lot of this is behavior change. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want that future. I don't want a future where I'm struggling to find enough water, where my dreams aren't about what change can I make in the world? Or where am I going to go to university? Or where am I going to be you know, in the next five years? What's my career going to look like? It's about water. That's not a future I want. I want a future where there's enough water for everyone forever. So, I run marathons. I struggle through the sand and the snow and the dirt, through the cold and the heat because I imagine a world where there's enough water, literally for everyone, for the rest of their lives. I want to create a world where we have a better tomorrow. I want to create a world where not just us, but our future generations can live and be happy and can achieve their dreams. Some people think that this is impossible. Some of you probably think that we need a massive overhaul of infrastructure. And I can stand here and tell you all the reasons why change is hard. Oh yes, it's money, it's jobs, it's infrastructure, it's all of those things. But the reality is that's actually not the case. All we need is a few changes from companies, from citizens, from, from people around the world. And we can make a difference on this planet. We need a few things to change. And the thing we most need to change is right here in this room, and it's us. Here's something I didn't know and you probably don't know either. Um, most of you are sitting here wearing a pair of shoes, a pair of pants, a shirt. You probably had a nice lunch. Hopefully you had the vegetarian option, but if you didn't, that's okay too. All the water that went into what you're wearing right now took more water to make than all the water you have drunk in your whole lifetime. It's kind of staggering, so I'm going to say it again because for me, this was a big eye-opener. All the water that went into what you're wearing today took more water than you have drunk in your entire lifetime. Right, that's really, for me, a bit of a scary thing because you know what it does? It actually says this water problem is not necessarily in the hands just of lawmakers, of farmers, it's in our hands too. Every single day when we reach into our wardrobe, we reach out to get a cup of coffee, we reach out to, do, to eat, we can think about how much water went into our stuff. So there you go. What we do every single day has everything to do with where we're going to be in 2025 and 2030. It's not the responsibility of other people, it's our responsibility too. So what does this mean? I think it means that we can succeed. I think it means that we can create a world where there's enough water for everyone forever. And I think it means that we can succeed because there are three basic purposes of this. The first one is I think we can succeed because of all of us. Most people in this room are here because you care about the environment. You're here because you're connected to someone, somehow, somewhere. You're here because you have access to resources. You're here because you made money out of investments or out of manufacturing or out of being associated with investments or manufacturing. You can make a difference. We're also going to succeed because ordinary people, people like these guys, this is my team. These are the guys that help me get across the world. People like these are willing to give up and willing to do things above and beyond what is normal to make a change, to make a difference on the planet. 
people who give up their time and energy to help us build this campaign. And we're also going to succeed because of these guys, the next generation. Amy told you about Thirst. So in 2012, when we started Thirst, we were literally a crazy idea which we sketched on a whiteboard. And Thirst has gone from a crazy idea in March 22nd, 2012, when we launched. We now, by the end of this year, will have educated one million kids in China. We work with over 400 schools. We've partnered with the Chinese government. Our innovation competition has over 150,000 kids participating. The groundswell of support from places like China amongst the young generation is unbelievable. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that the next generation cares. That tells me that the next generation wants to be able to say, we are kids and we care. And we want the world to be a better place. And we understand our impact. We understand the impact of our consumption patterns on the environment. And we want things to be done differently. And you know what these kids say to us? We don't want things to be done the way our parents and our grandparents did them before us. We want things to be done differently, smarter, better, better for the planet and better for us. So we are growing our campaign every single day. Every single day, step by step, through China and now we're going to go global. We're going to expand our messages and take them around the world because we can't solve this problem just by being in one country. We need the entire world to join us. We need to grow momentum. So what's coming next? I told you that my life changed on the banks of that Orange River in South, South Africa. And at that point in time, I thought my life is not going to finish until I have solved this problem. Fortunately for me, deathclock.com didn't even know there was such a thing existed. It tells me I've got actually quite a long time. So um, I've got time, I've got a lot of distance to run. And actually, I have decided that next year, in 2017, I'm going to run again. And this time, I'm going to run down rivers. I'm going to run down six rivers on six continents in six weeks. And I'm going to do it to raise awareness about the water crisis. And this time, I'm issuing a challenge. And the challenge I have is that I want six million people to come run at the same time as I'm running. CEOs, parents, kids, people, individuals. This is not about me anymore. This is about our planet and this is about the entire community drawing together. I told you at the beginning of this that the whole purpose is momentum. The whole purpose is to say, if I drop myself in the big ocean that is our world, and I can create one or two ripples, and those ripples create other ripples, then together just maybe we can change the world. Just maybe we can fundamentally shift this major, dire situation that we're facing. Maybe we can face extinction in the, in the face. We can stare it in the eyes, and we can say we can make a difference. And I think that if we can start to create momentum around this issue, if we can start to pull young people together, old people, middle-aged people, CEOs, people who are in all walks of life, because there's one thing that most people can do, and it's put a pair of running shoes on or move, move forward in one direction or another. Yeah, I don't kid myself that people will come and run a marathon. I don't care. The point is that we do something to save water, that every single day we all do one thing that makes a difference on this planet, that we together we pull ourselves up and we say, we are not prepared for a future where there's not enough water. We want a future where there's enough water for everyone forever. And for me, my philosophy is that sometimes we can't take a leap, but we can take a step. And I think that if we take steps together, we'll finally realize that one drop is a lonesome. We can be one drop. But together, if we work together, we can realise that we are together an ocean of change. That every single drop, that every single one of us saves, makes a difference. So I would encourage you all to think about water every time you turn on that tap, every time you go to the supermarket, every time you look at your clothes in the cupboard, and just understand what your water footprint is. And maybe, just maybe, you'll consider also coming out next year between February and March and coming for a run and hashtagging run for water. Because 
all of us can make a difference when we work together and realise that every drop counts. Thank you.